so last time we were talking about uh, the demand for insurance, and we basically said what? We, you know, well, we basically said that if you have diminishing margin utility of income, you, you're risk averse, and that if you took the expected value in dollars, right, it would be less when you took the expected value in utils, and you might find where you were, you had a higher utility from a certain amount than for the same expected value in dollar amounts. So people would, that, that's why people buy insurance, right? Um, so, uh, and we said that you could either buy insurance or you can, in a sense, uh, self-insure for a portion that is, you get anti-lock brakes in your car, you put smoke alarms up, uh, you have a deductible, co-insurance, that kind of thing. Um, so when you, if, when, if you guys ever go out to, you know, you might have bought your own car insurance or whatever, um, you'll find that, what, you have lower premiums if you have a higher deductible, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, we said that there are some things that might be uncertain that you offer a lower price for. So we said uh, treasury bonds, for example, or, uh, or bonds for a, a corporation by, you know, there's some uncertainty about whether that corporation is going to be able to pay those bonds back or not, so you'd offer a, a lower price for them. So today we're going to look at um, a number of things, but uh, the supply of insurance. So what about on the supply side? And uh, why would people uh, supply insurance? And the big thing about that is what we might call the law of large numbers. Then what, is, what do we mean by that? That is, you, it might be hard to predict when you're going to die, but if I were looking at when uh, 500,000 people might die, what do I do? I go to an actuarial table. Right? And I can, I can know that, okay, some people are going to die early um, and some people are going to die late, but we can sort of figure out when we're looking at people as a whole, we'll be able to figure out so that if I am uh, supplying insurance to 3,000 people, then I know more or I have a, uh, uh, the, the probability of being, uh, uh, figuring out when somebody's going to die is much higher than if I'm just looking at your individual probability. So the, the law of large numbers just, I mean, if you, you guys probably taken uh, a class where you talked about the, um, what happens if you have, uh, you flip a coin a thousand times, what's the probability that it's going to be off by a, you know, uh, less than 500 heads by a certain amount. Um, so that's, that's the idea here, is that we can figure out, uh, in the law of large numbers, I have ways of figuring out what the, what, with, with more certainty about when any, when any one particular event happens versus finding out, okay, I'm gonna insure 5,000 people, uh, what's the probability that they're all gonna live to be 95? Uh, or what's the probability they're all going to die at the age of 30, okay? Um, uh, so what are some problems in the supplying insurance? So you're out there selling insurance. What's the problem? Well, the first one is what we call moral hazard. And what's moral hazard mean? Moral hazard means that if you're insured against something, you're going to take on more risk, right? Right. You, you take on more risk if you're insured. Anybody remember from Econ 105? A bunch of took Econ 105, right? What did I say about drunk driving? What, what, what would I do if I wanted to reduce the risk that you take by driving when you're drunk? Anybody remember? Like a sharpened spike at the end of the steering column, right? What was that doing? The sharpened spike at the end of the steering column was saying, you know, when I get behind the car, or excuse me, when I get, when I, when I get behind the, uh, the wheel, if I got padded dash and I got, uh, you know, airbags and all this other stuff and I'm a little, little drunk, you know, can I drive back up to the college, right? I might say, okay, I'll go ahead and try it, right? 
But if there's a sharpened spike at the end of the steering column, right, I'm looking for the designated driver, right? So that's what moral hazard is about. If, I, if you have more, uh, if you're insured against something, you're going to take on more risky behavior. So how do we deal with that, right? We have coinsurance and, again, higher deductibles. Uh, and um, we'll give you a, a, a lower premium if you're a safe driver, right? So we, we'll do things that, uh, uh, if you're selling insurance, you'll try to do things which will uh, reduce people's on, taking on of risk. But that's, this is this moral hazard problem with regard to insurance. Um, second thing is what we've already talked about um, in a different perspective is what's called adverse selection. And what is that coming from? That's coming from information asymmetry. And this is the same problem that we already talked about in, when we were talking about when markets don't uh, have, have problems. This was Akerlof's Lemons Principle, right? When we were talking about you know more about the used car than the buyer does. And so there's some probability that that car is a lemon in which case I'm going to pay the expected value. So I'm going to pay less than the value of the car if it's fit, you know, if it's okay. And so what will happen is the lemons will drive out the, the, the good cars as, as, and more people then as the, as the uh, price of the good car goes down, right? More, more good cars don't show up because the expected, the, the expected value that you, the buyer is paying is less than the true value of it. You got the same thing going on, uh, going on here. You know more about your health or you know more about um, uh, how skilled you are uh, in terms of driving than does the insurance company. And so uh, again, what will happen is, um, Insurance companies will try to figure out who's higher risk, right? So I don't know if you ever bought life insurance, but if you were to buy life insurance, sometimes life insurance companies uh, have you um, uh, go, go take a physical, right? Uh, or um, you might charge more, if you're an insurance company, you might charge more in a neighborhood if it's uh, the west side of Chicago. I'm going to bet you, I know this for sure, but I'm going to bet you that uh, theft insurance in, uh, if you're, you know, insuring your uh, rental house uh, against theft uh, in the, the south side of Chicago uh, is going to be more expensive than if you're in uh, the north side of Chicago uh, because the crime rates are much higher in the south side of Chicago. And so, uh, and um, same thing with, uh, uh, you know, figuring out Who's a, who's a safe driver or whatever. So uh, what we'll try to do is I'll, I'll try to find something that's correlated with the, the riskiness and use that when I'm developing what my, uh, what my insurance premiums are gonna be. Um, so, uh, you know, the, whether you're a smoker or not, if you're a smoker, you might have to pay uh, higher premiums for uh, health insurance than if you're not a smoker, yeah. They could put, the, yeah, they, they, I mean, it depends on your car. Um, if you got a 1963 Ford or a Chevy Impala, probably doesn't have it, but who knows, right? And uh, Professor Butter's car has some sort of deal where um, he was telling me that uh, you, you set this thing and your, uh, your cruise control, and, but if you get too close to the other car, like the other car's starting to slow down or something, it automatically um, changes the speed to maintain the distance, right? So what will happen is, I will bet you, the car insurance for his car is going to be different than if I'm um, riding a motorcycle, okay? So again, the, 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 you, the uh, companies will try to find something that's correlated with whatever it is that they're trying to insure against and change their premiums or you have a higher deductible or whatever to try to offset that uh, information asymmetry. All right, um, 
So the last, uh, uh, the last point that we're going to make in terms of uh, uh, chapter two is, um, has to do with behavioral economics. And here's my eraser. Um, how many have had uh, Professor Clark's behavioral economics class? OK, so quite a number of you. All right. Um, what is behavioral economics? I mean, if you sort of think about it, what, uh, it's, a, it's a new, relatively new field. Um, you, right, if you had Econ 105 or 202 or whatever, um, you assume people are rational, self-interested individuals trying to make themselves better off, right? People are out there maximizing their utility function, subject to a budget constraint. Um, and uh, uh, again, um, people will, uh, uh, if, if I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to try to predict behavior. So I'm trying to structure the law so that we get the most efficient, uh, uh, the most efficient action by you folks, OK? Um, I, I, what I do is I assume, OK, people are rational. Uh, so if I, uh, if I have a, a, a fine for d uh, doing something, it'll reduce the probability that they'll do it, OK? Question is, what happens if they aren't rational in a certain sense? Um, are they predictable, predictably irrational? That's really what we're what this is about in terms of if we're talking about the legal system. If people are predictably irrational, then we can still structure the law if we think that this is the way that they're gonna uh, that they're gonna work. For example, um, anybody heard of uh, the ultimatum game? Ultimatum game. I mean, yeah, see, Roger Butters does it in, I guess, in his uh, principal's class or if you've seen it. So what's the ultimatum game? Ultimatum game says, OK, you two have a certain amount of money, let's say $100. And uh, I give it to person A, and they have to split it. And person A is going to offer something to person B. And if person B refuses that offering, then it goes away. They don't get anything, right? So let's say you had $100, and you're the person uh, that gets the, uh, gets the $100, and you got to make the offer to the other person about what the share ought to be. Well, if you sat there and said, oh, they're rational individuals. They know that if they refuse, they get zero, right? So I could offer them a dollar, and they should accept it, right? Because if they, if they say no, they're going to get nothing. So if I offer them a dollar, they ought to say yes, so I get to keep the $99, right? That would be the rational thing to do. What do we find out? When you, again, probably if you had the behavioral economics class or whatever, you find out that when they do studies, people turn it down. If they think that it's not fair in some sense, they're going to punish you. you. You make the offer, and they're going to punish you for being a jerk and only offering, you know, a, a, a $10 or whatever out of the 100 And so from a rational perspective, we would say, oh, they shouldn't do that, right? But then we might think, OK, well, here's what's really going on. They're really paying to, have, to, to punish you for, for being a jerk, OK? Um, Personally, my view is that if you, the dollar amounts that they're experimenting with might be sufficiently small that people are willing to do it. Like if they gave, let's say they gave this half of the class a million dollars and you guys, uh, are there, and they're going to offer to you guys a certain amount, maybe they offer you $100,000, are you going to say, <laughs> They're just being a jerk. I'm not, no, I'm turning that down. I don't know. So anyway, that's my own personal theory about when you look at these studies. Uh, you might want to, um, if you want to actually, again, you know, you, uh, if you wanted to uh, make this part of your 
um, your paper that you have due here, whatever, you know, maybe that might be something you might want to look into and say, okay, let's look at the size of the amount that they're, sh you know, sharing or not sharing in the, in the ultimatum games. But anyway, the point is, is that um, if people are predictably irrational, uh, then we can structure the, the law to make that. Another sort of uh, important bias is what's called hindsight bias. And what hindsight bias says is that um, your probability, you're estimating what the probability of something happen, happening is if you look at it after something's already happened, you're going to think that it's more probable than you did before it might happen. So it's hindsight bias. That is, if you're looking backwards, you say, oh, wow, um, there, you know, the, the, they should have known this was a, 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 a risk that, that, that would be taken. So here's, just as an example, um, if you, um, we want you guys to behave in a certain way to, to take on, if, if you're, let's say you're driving, right? And we don't want you driving around injuring other people. So we'd like you to what? To take on uh, a, uh, uh, you, to pr you try to prevent an accident using the marginal benefit of being more careful versus the, mar the, the, the uh, marginal cost of being more careful, right? You could, everybody could drive around at five miles an hour and we'd eliminate the, you know, we'd eliminate traffic accidents probably, right? But there's a cost to everybody driving around at five miles an hour. So what happens if, so what we'll do is, well, we'll talk about this later on, but we'll have law, we'll have a law that says if you cause an accident, right, then you might be liable and have to pay the injured party, right? So how much do we want to charge you if you cause a, 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 a damage to the other party? Or do we want to say if you didn't take enough precaution, then you're liable? Right? So that's one way we could do it. We could say, hey, this person was just, uh, you know, driving recklessly, okay? And so they're going to have, they're going to be liable for damage. Well, if we left it up to the jury, they're, they're going to think, wow, driving at that speed, we know the accident happened, so we might say, oh, driving at that speed was reckless, right? Um, what we might want to do is we might want to say, you, if you drive at the speed limit, we'll set a speed limit and say, if you're driving at the speed limit, then you're not having, you didn't drive recklessly, right? So um, what we might want to do is we understand that if I went to a jury or whatever, um, or, or even a judge, um, they might think that the probability of your having caused the accident by the, the thing that you were doing, that probability is higher than it really was. And so we would have you taking excess precaution, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it so that the precaution uh, is, the, uh, is efficient, right? We don't want it to take in too much precaution because the marginal benefit of that extra precaution is not equal to the marginal cost. The marginal benefit of everybody driving at five miles an hour is not equal to the marginal cost of everybody driving five miles an hour. So if I, you know, if, if what decides whether you weren't taking enough precaution is after the accident, then this hindsight bias might, uh, uh, might come into, uh, uh, come into play, and so we might want to have a law that says, okay, uh, if you're doing X, if you, um, uh, you know, driving at a certain speed limit, then, then you didn't, you, 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 weren't, uh, uh, you weren't reckless or something like that, right? So the point is, is that we're trying to make laws, uh, laws that are uh, efficient. Um, another thing that turns out that if you uh, find that, uh, uh, it turns out that if, if people hear, which is in the COVID era, um, is that if you hear a lot about something, um, you tend to think that it's more likely 
If you're a lot about incidents, uh, you think it's more likely. So if you, um, I mean, that's just, again, in behavioral economics, another thing you sort of learn. So if what happens is you hear every day about, you know, uh, uh, hurricane warnings or let's say global warming, right? We say, if you keep hearing, oh my gosh, you know, temperatures are higher and we've got more fires and da 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 da, and that's what you hear all the time, then your estimate of what the probability of uh, this really happening uh, is higher. And so there's that kind of bias. The point just simply is, is that if people have certain biases, if, if they're systematic, then what we can do is we can draft the laws to, under, to uh, account for the fact that there's going to be the systematic bias. All right. Okay, so we've now covered about everything that, you know, big picture things uh, that we'll be able to use economic theory to apply uh, to the law. So now we're going to look at chapter three, and this is about the legal institutions. How does it, how does it look, uh, you know, how does the law look in uh, different areas in the, and, the, uh, and the United States, but whatever. So, there's two major traditions. One is called civil law, and one is criminal law. So you have civil law and you have criminal law. Now, in what, what do you guys normally think of is state of Michigan, okay? The uh, Michigan House and Michigan Senate vote on a bill. Um, the governor signs it. It now becomes a law. Once that law is there, then judges then interpret uh, what the law is. Okay, um, if there is a, uh, uh, a law against uh, uh, a law against theft, right? It will say, uh, you know, you'll have some statute that's, that says, here's what the law is about theft. Here's what the penalties are, whatever. And then the judges determine, okay, yeah, this person uh, stole the thing, or they uh, or they didn't steal it. It was an uh, or whatever. And here's what the uh, the issues are. Now, in, when the judges interpret what the law is, which is normally what we think about, um, you can get what is called the judicial activism. Anybody heard of a guy named Robert Bork? Yeah, he was nominated for the Supreme Court, uh, got turned down uh, when Ted Kennedy was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, anyway, uh, he wrote a book called Tempting of America, which is a very good book. Um, and what he, one of the sort of main themes of in Tempting of America is that the judiciary um, actually is legislating from the bench. That is, rather than the legislature making the law, uh, the judges come in and they decide, here's, here's uh, what the law really meant and we're going to require this to happen. Um, and uh, so it's interesting, again, from uh, Econ 105, you know, Hayek's uh, Constitution of Liberty book, um, uh, he talks about the, uh, some of the uh, cases that are some of the, the, the legal structure that happened in the, um, uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, and what he argued um, was that uh, the, uh, when there was an attempt to pack the, you remember you heard about it, trying to pack the Supreme Court, um, and that when the, uh, the when the, the uh, president threatened to pack the Supreme Court, uh, that that led the uh, judicial branch to go ahead and say, oh yeah, okay, these things are, um, are uh, uh, th these things are uh, not constitutional, okay? Um, 
Bork talks about, uh, has a whole different view of uh, what was going on, and he thinks that what was going on is the Supreme Court didn't like the, um, the, the reason they declared the National Recovery Act unconstitutional, uh, sure to remember what, what happened was they originally declared uh, uh, some of the legislation unconstitutional. Um, he argued that the Supreme Court didn't like the economic outcomes of that and therefore they declared it unconstitutional. So you have, in, in this case you had both uh, again, from Econ 105, we talked a little bit about this, but in this case, you have two conservatives. Uh, one of, and Bork is what we think is a sort of a limited government type of person, and Hayek certainly a limited government type person. They both have opposite views of what was going on in the, this uh, instance uh, in, uh, where Roosevelt was uh, trying to, um, uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, was, was what he was originally doing, was that really unconstitutional and, uh, and it was being declared that way. And then when he threatened to pack the court, the court just sort of, you know, gave in. Um, or was it a matter of the court being a judicial activist, saying that, hey, you know, we're requiring, uh, 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 we're, we're declaring this unconstitutional and why are they doing that? Because they don't like the economic outcome of it. They are, they're basically legislating from the bench. So, but the point here being that um, uh, uh, there's a, I don't know if you ever heard this court case called Roe versus Wade. Um, anyway, uh, very interesting discussion in, about Roe versus Wade in, uh, uh, in, in Bork's book, Tempting of America. So if you get a chance, you might wanna just uh, uh, take a look at that book. So, okay, uh, we have, two major ways of, uh, of creating the law. Um, one way, so how do we create law? One is what's called common law. And what common law is that the, it's, a, it's the idea of um, establishing a rules of the game that create some certainty and therefore it has to do with precedent. That is in common law, what you do is the judges, uh, in, in common law, the judges to say, okay, here's the situation, it looks a lot like this other situation, you guys understand what you know how the rules of the game have been this is the way we've been doing it for the last hundred years okay and so I'm, I'm saying this situation looks a lot like the other one and so this is what I'm going to rule so in the common law basically what goes on is the judge the judges decide they say okay I'm going to rule on this action. Um, I'm going to say, this is what happened here. This looks a lot like what we said the law was 10 years ago. And so that's, that's what we're going to declare here. And so the common law is basically a system uh, where um, you guys, uh, uh, what, what the society thinks that, you know, the, the rules uh, that are fair, right? This is, this is the way we think we ought to do it, and what are we doing? We're making sure that there's some certainty over time. Again, from Econ 105, Hayek talks about the rule of law versus rule of man, right? Um, and what he's, he, what he's saying is that, you know, the law ought to be structured in such a way that you guys know what the law is. I'm not going to open up a, uh, I'm not going to open up I mean, if you think about it now, all sorts of rules just changed, right? Um, how many people I can have in my restaurant? Or can my restaurant be open? Or can my bar be open, right? So if that is the way that we do it, then th what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a bunch of uncertainty, right? Are you gonna open up, I mean, think of how many people are gonna open up a bar right now, 
uh, in, uh, let's say, even in the state of Michigan, um, if what you know is tomorrow the governor could say, ah, can't, you know, can't, uh, can't have any, bar can't have bars. Your bar can't be open, right? So you want to have some certainty in what the rules of the game are, and common law does that, right? Common law is about, okay, let's look at precedent. Here's what, and the judges are looking at this, this situation saying, okay, there's some conflict here and the two parties don't agree, there's a conflict and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, ah, this situation looks a lot like the one that happened before, this is the way we've been doing it and so uh, that be, that's what uh, common law is about. Um, in addition, when we're thinking about this is the idea that there's some limitation on the ability to establish law, right? Well, there's some limitation on the ability of the judge or the legislature, which we'll talk about in just a minute, to uh, create law, right? That is, there's been a long tradition about that. Should, the, should, again, going back to Hayek's idea of rule of law versus rule of man, could the, could the king tomorrow just open up and say, hey, this is where I'm, ch I'm changing the rules of the game tomorrow, right? Or is there some limitation on what the king can do? And if we look back historically in, uh, in, in, in the English, uh, kings and the, the kings in the court, Right, so, so we'll look at England. We have the kings in the court. They can only discover the law. That is, they couldn't just, um, uh, or, 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 or uh, not discover, let's put a, a better way to put it, excuse me, a better way to think of that is to, to find the law. That is, they can't just make up the law. They're gonna say, oh, I'm making this proclamation and this proclamation is consistent with what we've been doing before. So that there's some, con now of course that's very loose, right? Um, you're not gonna hire uh, some uh, high powered attorney back in England in 1275 or something like that. Uh, but that, that there was still this concept out there that the king couldn't just say any old darn thing. That the, 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 you know, it, this has to be consistent with the way we've been running things. I mean, that's basically the point, right? This has to be consistent with the way we've been, that, you know, we've been running, uh, we, we've been running the, the, the system. Uh, and so again, this has to do with uh, uh, the rules of the game. If, and again, in Econ 105, where we talk about Aqu uh, Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, right? And what did he talk about? He talked about there was these levels of law, right? He said there is, uh, there's uh, divine law, right? There's natural law, and then there's this human law, right? So that uh, if we, um, I can't have a human law that's in violation of natural law. Right? Or I can't, have a, I can't create a human law that's in uh, uh, violation of divine law. Now, again, in Econ 105, what do we say that Hayek, Hayek says the, in the, the Constitution in the United States, that is when we first started writing it down because I don't really know what divine law is, right? I mean, you can, you can Google divine law, chapter 12, Section 16, subdivision A, and go, oh yeah, there it is. No, it's not written down, right? So uh, what, what Hayek argues is that, the, the, that there's a long been this concept that there's a limitation on however you create law, whether it's common law or civil law, however you create it, there's a limitation on your ability to create law. And why would you have that? You'd have that so you have some sort of certainty about what the rules, uh, what the, what the rules of the game 
rules of the game all. Okay, so again, um, there's a, um, a, a finding of the rule of law uh, are, is setting precedents, and precedents are giving you some certainty about what, what, what's going to happen. All right, so this is the tradition uh, in England, and that, so in English, England tradition, what do you primarily do? You primarily look at precedent, right? You, got, you, you two have a conflict about something, the, the, uh, the, the court's going to rule, here's what the, uh, you know, here's what the rules of the game are, um, and we want to make it so that it tends to be the same over time, so that if you're in a situation, you know that there'll be a similar, uh, uh, a similar result. Um, and so, uh, if we um, uh, look at the um, French tradition, what happens is, at the time of the revolution in France, they say, you know what, we think that the judges and the kings are corrupt, right? We think these characters are just going to go around and doing whatever they think they want to do. So that uh, if, if we look at this, we say, okay, we don't want We don't want the king or court to decide. So what we're going to do is we're going to have civil law. And that's basically statutory. Okay? We're going to write down what the law is. Um, and I don't know if you heard of this guy. His name's Napoleon. Um, but uh, Napoleon set out the Napoleonic Code, right? So you codify what the law is. Um, and it was basically based on Justinian civil law from about the middle of the 500s. Um, but the idea was that we're going to write down what the law is. Um, and that's what we call civil law. So when the stat, it, obviously, um, in, come up to this in a second, but obviously we have this mixture of it in the United States, right? You have statutory law, but also if you go to law school, what are you going to do? You're going to do case studies. And what are case studies about? Case studies are, hey, here's what the common law is, right? We did it this way. This case looks a lot like that way. So if you read uh, Supreme Court cases or if you read uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, appellate court, and they write down, here's what we decided, how did we decide it? We just, it'll say, you know, uh, this case looks a lot like this case over here. And this is what we did in that prior case, and so that's what we're doing here. That's a common law thing. But it might say, here's what the law reads. Here, here's, the, here's the written law. And whatever, you know, whatever the legislature says, this is what the law is, okay? So the, the, the idea of civil law, the idea of writing it down in statutes, comes basically through the Napoleonic era. Uh, and if you look at what type of law exists in different countries, it tends to be, whether it was a French colony or whether it was a, uh, a, a British colony. So uh, if you look through um, uh, Quebec, right? Uh, if you've been, we already talked about, did we already talk about people being from Canada in here? Really? Okay, he, yeah, Ryan says, yeah, we've talked about this. Um, yeah, if you're, uh, Quebec is part of Canada. Right, and uh, you know, and, and and they don't talk in Quebec like they do in the rest of Canada. I don't know if you ever noticed that, eh? So if you're from the UP, eh, you tend to talk like you're from other parts of Canada, um, and uh, so that's why you spell Canada that way, right? It's C A N A D A. Okay, that's my joke for the day. Um, all right. Um, so uh, in uh, uh, you know, if we if we look at uh, there tends to be more uh, 
uh, statutory or civil law in places that are uh, uh, a, a province of uh, France uh, versus uh, the more common law tradition uh, tends to be uh, in, a, uh, in uh, British colonies. Um, and of course, today there's a mixture of both. Right? We have both written law and we have common law, so when you go to law school, that's why you learn uh, uh, court cases. Other places might be very different, right? Uh, Japan, Islamic law might be uh, in, certain, in certain places that Islamic law might dominate. Um, so uh, you just sort of, uh, the, you know, the point being that the current law, whatever it is, might be based on a tradition of how, it, and, you know, how did it come about uh, over time. Um, notice that um, common law, as I've mentioned several times, common law tends to be taught through case study, um, where civil law is based on, you know, a reading of the statute, right? So if we look at common law, right, uh, what you're going to look at is case studies, but in civil law, you're going to be careful about reading the statute. What did the statute say? What does it mean? Right? What is the actual language of the, of the, of the statute? Um, and uh, when I left, I left academia, uh, I had been teaching at uh, uh, University of Michigan, Dearborn, and I left to go to um, the legislature, and I became the economist for the uh, Republican senators uh, back in uh, uh, 1983. Um, and so I get there, and the, um, the Democrats control the Senate at the time. And the way, of course, it works is if you control the Senate, you get the chairmanship of every committee, right? Uh, and you get a majority on every committee. So the Senate Finance Committee had five members, um, three Democrats, two Republicans. And so I get up there, and I'm starting to learn how this works. And there's a bill uh, in front of the committee, and this guy, Howard Heideman, became a friend of mine. Uh, he was the uh, advisor for the Democratic senators. Um, and uh, Howard would get up there, and he would you know, some, he would say, here's, what the, here's, what, here's why you need this bill, here's what this bill does. One of the senators would say, oh, can we do this amendment? And he would say, no, because this is going to violate this other section of the statute or whatever. And so I'm watching Howard's controlling what the heck's going on, right? So what are, what's my thought? How the heck do you do that, right? So I go to Howard. I say, Howard, how in the world, why, how do you run this whole thing? And he said, know the law. He said, know the law. Know the law better than anybody. Know the Property Tax Act from start to finish, right? Well, of course, then what happened was two Democratic senators got recalled in 1984 and was replaced by Republicans. And so within six months of my getting there, I'm now in Howard's spot because the Republicans now control the Senate. First time, only time, that's ever happened in uh, Michigan history that a body flipped in between elections. But the point here is that knowing the law was vitally important because what we were in Michigan were basically a civil law, you know, and I didn't have to deal with, um, I didn't have to deal with if there was a court case going on and the, you know, somebody's got us suing somebody or whatever. I'm dealing with what the statute's going to be, right? I'm dealing with what the written statute's going to be. And so knowing what the law is is vitally important uh, whenever you're looking at, uh, when, when you ever look at uh, uh, civil law. So again, um, in, the, in, in the United States, you've got this mixture between uh, civil law and uh, common law. Now. If we, again, look how it works, um, in common law, if we have, a, we have a court case, and we'll talk it next time about how things arrive in court, but let's say you're, you, you have a court case. Uh, in common law, the arguments are made by both sides.
right, made by both sides of the, of the issue. Right, um, there's a, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, something uh, asbestos in uh, in something uh, asbestos in uh, you know the insulation, uh, and somebody gets sick or whatever. So now somebody sues somebody says, oh, they should you know they shouldn't have had this insulation or whatever, right? So what you have in a, in common law, it turns out that the um, the two parties uh, are the ones that talk back and forth. Sell them does the judge question. Right? It's not a matter of where the judge is questioning each of the parties about this and the judge is running the show. What's going on is your attorney, or you could represent yourself, but your attorney is arguing something and the other attorney's arguing something, and the judge is sitting back and maybe ask a question every now and then to make sure that they, they understand what's going on. But there it's, it's uh, adversarial, right? So it's It's adversarial, and the judge is a referee, which leads me to the classic album of the week. Right? Been building on this. I want to make sure I got through this so I could put it in. Classic album of the week is Warren Zevon, Excitable Boy. How many have heard of Warren Zevon? I can't believe it. You guys. Warren Zevon. Uh, yeah, you, um, you really, uh, you ever heard of a song called Werewolves of London? Okay, that's, that's Warren Zevon. It's on this album. But uh, more importantly on this album is a song called uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And there's a line in it where it's, he says, send lawyers, guns, and money, get me out of here. Okay? That's the way it works in an adversarial, uh, pro the adversarial process in common law, right? I'm going to send the lawyers are the ones that make the that argue with one another, and the judge just listens to what's going on, and they're the referee. So we have an adversarial process where you hire uh, one of these uh, major law firms, Bernstein Law Firm or whatever, uh, and of course you try and find a good law firm or a better law firm, but then you got to Again, you sort of think about we're going to use expected value again, right? Okay, I got to decide what's the expected value of my hiring Bernstein versus hiring this other person. What's the probability they're going to win? Da 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 da, right? But the but the point here is that uh, as Warren Zevon says in this one, send lawyers guns and money. Um, don't really need the guns probably, uh, but uh, anyway, the the lawyers and the money part are certainly part of part of this. All right. Uh, so for Monday, um, we are uh, going to st still be working on, uh, on, on chapter three. Um, there's a section on the court structure in the U.S. Not going to lecture on that, right? I mean, it's just pretty obvious. Uh, you can read that on your own. Uh, you, know, you know, how many uh, uh, different districts we have and how that works, et cetera. You guys can just read that on your own. But we'll be working our way through chapter three. For the midterm, the hope is to, we'll, uh, the, the, we will certainly have done property law, which is also section, uh, chapters four and five. Five is special topics in property law, but that's where we're headed for for the midterm. So over the weekend, you might want to just go ahead and read through chapter three uh, in, uh, in, the, in the textbook. All right? All right. Have a good weekend. And listen to Warren Zevon. At least werewolves of London. <laughs>